Good evening, saints of God, or maybe it's good day where you're at right now. This is Pastor Tim from the Potter's House of Oceanside, California, coming to you from the Bible Corner here in my house. And uh, I've got another study in our series called uh, Creepy Stories of the Bible. And today we're looking at a story in 2 Kings chapter 1. So we spent a lot of time in uh, Kings because there's a couple of really interesting people in uh, who are supernaturally empowered. And they're types of uh, the believers that we're called to be. And the two people I'm thinking of for this uh, next couple of studies are Elijah and Elijah. So we'll talk about them a little bit. And we'll also relate this a little bit to some things that are happening now with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, this is May of 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic. And they've just finally announced in this county that churches can get back together and have assemblies of 100 or less, which is uh, just about right for our church. So we're going to be back together tomorrow night. But in the meantime, we'll keep doing a Bible study from the Bible Corner uh, because I enjoy doing this, and I hope you do too. And if you're bored, uh, I'm sure you tuned in for some good reason. Maybe it was to see which T-shirt I would be wearing today. Today I've got the uh, Columbus uh, River Dragons on here. That's a uh, professional hockey team from the IHL that's in Columbus, Georgia. So who'd have thought that in the 21st century, the best hockey teams would be in the South or in the uh, Western states and not in Canada? <laughs> wow. So I think it's definitely a crazy world we live in, upside down and backwards. But anyways, uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at our creepy Bible study for today. And again, I'm really interested in these two men, Elijah and Elijah. Very similar uh, names. They sound very similar. If you say them fast, you'll say them wrong, probably. Uh, or you'll confuse them. They'll sound like the same name, but they're not the same people. Elijah was the first of the two. And he actually uh, makes his appearance in 1 Kings and a few other places in the Bible. But he uh, makes his appearance during the days of Ahab. And he's an interesting guy. His name means Elijah means uh, my God is Yahweh. My God is Yah, or in Hebrew, Yahweh. And uh, apologies to my Messianic brethren or Jewish brethren who may be turning, tuning in because I know they're not comfortable with that name being actually spoken. They prefer to just say Hashem, the name, which is a reference to that word. <clears throat> the uh, Bible uh, spelling of that is often capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, because even the, uh, the scholars weren't comfortable translating that word. It was a difficult word to translate. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Elijah is a conjunction. My God is Yahweh. My God is Yah, or Jah, as the reggae uh, performers would call it, and uh, <clears throat> taking their Old King James and using the uh, English translation of Yah, which is uh, Jah. And so we get Elijah. And his disciples, a man named Elijah, a very different name. And there's some very different uh, aspects of their ministry. Elijah is a very uh, intense, mysterious, intimidating, unapproachable. Uh, prophet, a classical Old Testament prophet uh, in one sense. And he is a type of the law. He's a type of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, the law, the Mosaic law. And why do we say that? Because his nature it tends to be a little bit unforgiving. And uh, <clears throat> at one point, he's even convinced that he's the only one left serving God in the whole nation. Hence his name, my God is Yahweh. But the truth is, uh, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. So he was rebuked by God while sitting in the cave, which is believed to be the same cave, Mount Horeb, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. It's actually located in Saudi Arabia. It's not that Mount Sinai that you see uh, the, on the tourist brochures uh, between Egypt and uh, Israel. It's actually in uh, 
the northwest uh, corner of Saudi Arabia. And so this is where they wandered in the desert. They didn't wander in the uh, Sinai desert. They wandered in the desert of Sin, which is the ancient name for the desert of uh, northwest Saudi Arabia. So anyways, getting back on track. So here's Elijah and Elijah, this very different man that we're going to look at in a later study. The name uh, Elijah means God is my salvation. And Eli is the part that says my God, right? El being a, a shortened version of Elohim, which is the generic name for God in the uh, Old Testament. And uh, it's also a plural form, which is interesting. Our Trinity, right? <clears throat> it's contained in that. But L is a shortened Eli Elijah. Ja is a uh, shortened uh, version of the Hebrew word for salvation. It's the same word that's in Yeshua or Joshua, uh, which is Yeshua is actually translated into the Greek as Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> and so, uh, this is uh, these words are all connected. Elijah, God is my salvation. And so, this is really interesting because. We know that uh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, uh, is preoccupied with the salvation of all of humanity by his death on the cross, his sacrifice. And that was his mission. That was his purpose. And Elijah is much more of a, of a redemptive prophet than Elijah. He, he has exactly twice as many miracles. He prayed for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He had twice as many miracles. They were healing miracles, and they were miracles that Jesus purposely copied in some cases, such as multiplying loaves and fishes. He purposely copied this to identify with God as my salvation, with that name, Elijah. So, uh, enough about those names. We're not going to talk about Elijah much right now, because we're going to look at a creepy story. Chapter 1 of... Uh, of Second Kings. So why don't we go to our Bibles? I keep looking, glancing over here at my Bible. And let's begin with the first uh, seven or eight verses. Let's go with the eight verses. And this is a story about God's judgment on a king of Israel named uh, Ahaziah. Moab, I'm in verse one of uh, Second Kings. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. For Ahaziah fell, oh, excuse me, now, I can see, see what my glass is better. Let's go back to verse 2. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, god of Ekron, for thou shall recover from this injury. Uh, but the angel of the Lord said, to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up and meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now, Baalzebub is an interesting name. Beelzebub, we might say that from uh, from in the English, when we say it fast, it's a little, it's hyphenated here in the text in, in the New King James. Baalzebub, Baal means Lord. It's the uh, name for the uh, pagan deity, Baal. He's the Lord. He's the Lord of the gods. He's Zeus. He is Allah. He is the Lord of the supreme God uh, of those who do not know Yahweh. And so he comes in many forms. He's Thor. Not Thor. He's, who's the king of the, uh, he would be Odin, I guess. He's the, or Woden. He's the uh, father god, Marduk, uh, of these pagan religions and so <clears throat> Jupiter would be another name for him but so this is the name Baal but Zebub is of the flies so this is saying the the god of the flies the lord god of the flies which is a pretty pathetic deity to worship I mean I squash flies all the time with my hand my bare hand and I'm sure if there's a lord amongst them uh he's been under my foot a few times so that's a very, very uh, sad name. And so this is the God of Ekron. So this is uh, 
uh, Elijah the prophet coming out, he knows where these messengers are going. He knows exactly what's going on. Elijah, Elijah had uh, quite a word of knowledge ministry, quite, quite a bit of discernment, understanding of things that were happening. And so he challenges these messengers as they're uh, going. And he says, uh, now therefore says the Lord, uh, shall you not come down from the bed to which you have gone up? But you, sh you shall surely die. So these men are going to Ekron. They're going to go consult the Lord of the flies. Elijah shows up there in verse 3, Elijah the Tishbite, and he mocks them. He says, are you saying there's no God here that's a little better than the Lord of the flies? Hello? Knowing that they're supposed to be followers of uh, uh, the true God of Yahweh. And so they're not following Yahweh. But what are they doing? They're going after any metaphysical thing. They'll give them the answer they want. And there's Christians like that. They were raised in the church. They fell away. They're not interested in Christianity or Jesus. They're looking for answers in all the wrong places. Yoga, which is a great form of idolatry. Uh, some of you ladies are into it. It gives you peace because you're being bound by a spirit. Uh, it's a perverted spirit, too, by the way. It'll affect you in the long run. It'll affect your children. It's a curse. Other people are looking for answers, and psychics are looking for answers, uh, maybe praying to the Virgin Mary instead of Jesus, which is a completely unnecessary thing to do, ladies. Mostly women do this. Uh, but men do, too. Men are looking for answers in metaphysical things and false religions <clears throat> when they should know better. So these men should know better. And so the prophecy is, now therefore thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. So you see, so you see he comes in. He, he knows that, the, uh, that these messengers are being sent to Ekron. He meets the messengers from the king of Samaria, which is the northern kingdom of Israel. And he says, uh, just tell your master he's going to die. And then he takes off. That's it. No explanation necessary. No sticking around for their questions. You don't got time for that. Uh, <clears throat> so when the messengers returned to him, talking about Ahaziah the king, they had returned to him. He said to them, why have you come back? So they said to him, a man came up to meet us and said to us, go, return to the king who has sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there's no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he, this is Ahaziah again, and he said to them, What kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, A hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Isn't that interesting? Ahaziah knows who the man of God is. He knows who the real men of God are in his community. But he didn't ask for them, did he? He purposely chose not to ask. But when he hears the bad report, because that's the thing about us. We know we're going to do something wrong, but we really want to validate ourselves. We want to just hear good news. We want our ears tickled. And so we'll go to somebody. It's better to call the psychic hotline. They always give me a good report. I go to my pastor for advice. He always tells me to live right and doesn't tell me I'm going to be rich. and doesn't tell me I'm going to get the woman or man of my dreams. But the psychic does. Well, keep paying your $200 per psychic visit or whatever you pay, but the truth is you're hearing a lie. And so the truth does hurt. And Ahaziah didn't want to hear the truth. He knew who Elijah with the Tishbite was. He knew what he looked like. He describes him to the messengers, and now he's in a bind, and he's a little upset. Because number one, he heard a bad report that he didn't want to hear. And number two, <clears throat> by intercepting these messengers and mocking the Lord of the Flies that uh, Ahaziah was going to go inquire from, uh, <clears throat> he's kind of been dissed a little bit say the least, by Elijah. Now, one thing about Elijah is he doesn't regard politicians as anybody special. He regards them 
He treats him with respect. He calls him king. He doesn't call him knucklehead. He's not uh, spray painting graffiti on the walls of Samaria or doing anything disrespectful that way. But his Lord is who? Yahweh. My God is Yahweh. And so to him, the king is not someone to be feared. Yahweh is the one that we fear. We respect our God. Because we do, we put him first in all things. Because we do, when he tells us to tell the truth, we're going to tell it. And because we do, we're going to make some decisions that unbelievers will not understand. Unbelievers don't know why we want to be back in church when a pandemic hitting our nation in spring of 2020 closes all the churches. <clears throat> in fact, they want to blame the churches for spreading the pandemic because they're having secret church and people are getting sick, which isn't true. <clears throat> because you can take plenty of precautions inside a church just like you can in any other business or assembly or wherever people are going, uh, especially as we reopen uh, the nation after the worst pandemic crisis uh, to ever hit us. And so at least since the Spanish influenza. So anyways, here we are. And so the unbelievers don't get it. But one thing that Ahaziah knows, he knows this is a real man of God that I'm dealing with here. And so he's thinking, I got to deal with him somehow. I got to, he dissed me, man. I got to get the last word in. <coughs> Excuse me. Not COVID, thank you. Uh, anyways, uh, but let's continue on. He's been dissed. And so what does it say in verse 9? Then the king sent to him, the king Ahaziah sent to Elijah, captain of 50 with his men. So he went up to him. And there he was, sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, Man of God, the king has said, come down. Man of God, the king demands to talk to you right now. Now again, the principle I just mentioned is that we should obey God, not men. And again, I believe in Romans 13, 1, we do obey the authorities appointed over us. We don't drive 90 miles an hour and say, well, I can only do the Lord's work at 90, not at 55, <clears throat> when the speed limit's 55. But I try that excuse. It doesn't work with policemen. Anyways, uh, the point is, uh, when it comes to things that uh, get between us and God, the king is not going to get between us and God. The governor, the president, they don't get between us and God. We're not, we don't let people get between us and God. And that's the principle that's being taught here. And so these are military men. They're called captains of 50, which would be like the equivalent of a an American infantry platoon, maybe a lieutenant or a first lieutenant or a little bit smaller than a company. And here they are. They're come, trooping up there. They are armed and dangerous, and they have the authority of the king behind them. But again, just like it says in Acts, right? When uh, John and Peter are confronted, <clears throat> uh, should we listen to you or God, you judge. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, man. God is real. He's above you, and he's real to us. And sorry you don't believe, because what happens to unbelievers? Well, let's look what happens. Verse 10, so Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, in other words, if what you're saying is true, Implication being, and why are you telling me what the king wants? If I listen to God before the king, why are you trying to tell me that the king, I have to jump when the king says jump? Because he's just doing this because he wants to have the last word on a little discussion I launched in his direction. If I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now, what's kind of left not said here is, remember I mentioned Elijah, the disciple of Elijah. Elijah is probably here when this happens. He's probably watching this because he's recruited way back here in 1 Kings somewhere to be the disciple of Elijah, right? 
and uh, he's recruited, and he's going to carry the mantle of Elijah, starting around verse, middle of chapter 2, rather. And so, he's probably here to watch all this. And imagine what that must have looked like. Elijah's just sitting on a hill, probably praying, probably maybe even just having a little moment of a teaching moment with his disciple, Elijah. Here come the men of 50. Like, hey, thus says the king, you're going to come with us, buddy. And he looks at him and he says, if I'm a man of God, like you say I am, then may fire come down from heaven. And sure enough, it does. We don't know what it would look like. Maybe it looked like a lightning. Maybe it looked like a giant meteorite coming down. I don't know. It must have been pretty specific because it only takes out these, uh, these 50 and their captain, 51 men. <clears throat> then he, speaking about Ahaziah the king, sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, Man of God, thus has the king said, Come down quickly. Up, oh, sounds like he's making the same mistake as the previous captain of 50 did. So Elijah answered and said to him, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Now you can imagine, here's the second captain of fifty marching up the hill. And the earth is probably a little scorched. Probably smells like a really bad barbecue right around that time. Burning flesh. <clears throat> piles of ash. I don't know what was left of the previous uh, 51 people, <laughs> soldiers, but these guys are walking up and they're seeing whatever was left there of them. And they're going to do the same exact thing. They're going to march right up to uh, Elijah. They're going to say, hey, the king ought to talk to you now, sucker. Man of God. Well, if I'm a man of God, let Fire, and this man, their eyes probably went like this as soon as he said that, because they know what was coming next. I'm sure Elijah was standing behind him going, uh-oh, <clears throat> knowing that this is watching his, his pastor Elijah call down fire on these guys. Verse 13, and again, he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up marching past piles of ash, scorched earth, barbecued flesh. You know, bodies smell really bad when they start deteriorating, folks. Ask somebody that's been to Iraq or Afghanistan what that's like. So here they are, they're coming up the hill and they're thinking about it a little bit more. Maybe this captain's a little different. Maybe he's got a little bit of fear of the Lord in him. These first two guys are like your typical pragmatic, you know, functional atheist military people, you know, just enough religion to, you know, comfort panicky fellow soldiers or to give themselves courage in a fight, but not really believers. This third guy has a little bit more fear, inspired, I'm sure, by the piles of ash and the scorch bones and earth as he's walking up that hill so the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knee on his knees before elijah elijah and pleaded with him and said to him man of god please let my life and the life of those 50 servants of, our, of yours be precious in your sight he's actually calling his own men your servants he's recognizing because he's watched a couple of other people get a whooping, he's recognizing the authority of God that's operating in Elijah's life. And instead of coming up in the name of the king, acting all cocky and bold and don't got time for this religious tripe, just come along like you're asked. Instead of acting that way, this man falls on his knees. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want people to fall on their knees around me because I'm a pastor, but you know, it is sad that uh, in America, pastors are mocked the way they are. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a pastor, because I'm a, I'm a, 
I'm a grown man. I'm a fully uh, realized man. I don't. I could care less if you laugh about me because I'm spending most of my time laughing about you anyway. So it doesn't really matter to me. I'm I'm, I'm one of those people that's not phased. <clears throat> but I, I do know that some of my brethren are phased because they're giving their whole life to help people and to preach the gospel and they love people. And they're treated pretty poorly by this culture that we call America. God bless America. Uh, God doesn't bless sin. So I hope you're paying attention captains of 50 out there, whoever you are, <clears throat> because God is not going to be mocked. And it's not because I'm saying it, it's because God's word says it. All right, let's keep going. Um, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s and <laughs> with their 50s. But let my life now be precious in your sight. Because of this man's humility, God extends his grace. And look what it says next. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. So this man's just doing his job. And I know that's true of a lot of people in our law enforcement community when it comes to you know, arresting pastors for having, God forbid, a drive-in service. God forbid letting some people in this building to pray. I know you're just doing your job as you let out the rapists and the <clears throat> sexual, other sexual predators, the child molesters out of jail for because you're saving them from COVID-19. You're arresting pastors. I know you're just doing your job, sucker. <clears throat> but... The truth is, God loves you very much, and so do I. And so God doesn't want to kill these captains of 50. He just wants them to be respectful. You can do your job without being a jerk, without hurting people, and especially people who are just trying to do something for God. So anyways, moving on to our text, this captain of 50 has has God's mercy on him because he, he does respect Elijah and he has fear the fear of the Lord in him. <clears throat> and he's just doing his job, man. His, what he's doing is no different what, than what those other two men had. The attitude was his heart. There was humility there. And, uh, you know, that's what America needs. That's what our officials need. And those who enforce the law, you need to have some humility. All right? Let justice flow down, man, like the water. Mercy and justice flow down like the water, man. It doesn't mean we go light on criminals or light on <clears throat> people that need uh, to be dealt with. But it means, though, that we have to forget at the end of the day that we're sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen. <clears throat> so now Elijah is dragged before Ahaziah. Then he said to him, this is Elijah speaking to Ahaziah the king. Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, the lord of the flies, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Ahaziah, hoping to get a different response out of Elijah. The truth is, Ahaziah could have got a different response out of God by simply praying and repenting. He has a little accident, falls through the lattice on his roof, lands probably on his back, broke his back or his neck possibly, carried to a bed, <clears throat> wants an answer, but he doesn't want to get his heart right. A lot of people are like that. To them, God is a metaphysical force that gives them the answers they want to hear. But God is not like that. God is a righteous God. He, is, he does love you very much. But always asking you to be, is be honest about your sinfulness. You're not all that. We're not all that. I know I'm not. I, I had a pretty serious fall in, in uh, November 1990 off a of rock face in Dahlonega, Georgia. And when I was going through Ranger School and I fell, and a man grabbed the rope, saved my life. But while I was falling, man, I cried out to God. All my pride, all my 
Pua, Army Ranger, tough guy, miss. It wasn't going to save me as I fell through the air at that moment. All you self-reliant tough guys out there, sorry. <clears throat> sorry you're so cynical and stuck on you, man. But you're not going to save yourself. You can't anyways. I don't care how good a soldier you are or tough guy you are in whatever field you're in. There's always some random event that can take you out, man. <clears throat> God doesn't want to do that because God loves you. He wants to save you. He loves you so much. So for the unbeliever, the pragmatic, atheistic, functional atheist anyways, whether you're a man or a woman out there, don't be that way. Have a repentant spirit, man. I know someday I'm going to die. Maybe I will fall through my lattice and land on my back, and I'll get a report from the Lord. Tim, I'm not healing you this time. You're coming home to be with me. I'm ready for Jesus, man. I'm ready for that day to come. Are you? If something should happen to you now and you get called, <laughs> tonight your soul is required of you. It's not a fear tactic because it's pointed to all, all of us to die once, but after that's a judgment. Life is but a vapor, man. Short, shorter than you'd like. I'm in my 50s, moving into my 60s, and life is short, man. I don't got tomorrow promised to me. Never did. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place. In the second year, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which weren't much because he died, <laughs> uh, which he did, are they not written in the book, of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And that's interesting. That if you want to read the Chronicles of the Kings of, is of Israel, that's actually right after... Right after Second Kings, it's Chronicles. So the Bible, of course, the Bible, of course, is designed in such a way by God that it references itself. It's not a circular reference either, because there's plenty of archaeological and other research that's been done. We know where this stuff came from. I've been to Israel six times. I know where the holy sites are, and I know the Bible is accurate. God really cares about you. So as we close up our message tonight, Creepy Bible Story Part 2, and I'm not sure which story we'll look at next week, but I'll find something that'll have that element of creepiness to it, because God wants you to know about the supernatural side. This isn't all there is, this physical realm that we live in. Life really is more like that movie, The Matrix, than we want to admit. <laughs> but the spiritual realm isn't The Matrix. It's something totally different. And the God, only God's Word can really reveal it to you. You need to understand that. God wants you to know what's on the other side because you're going to pass through the veil someday. And He wants to receive you, man, so badly. Eternity in the presence of God forever, man, is joy, 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 without any shedding of tears or any regrets. So it's going to be another existence, whole universe to explore until the end of eternity, which will never end. <laughs> A universe that goes forever. Time that goes forever with God. So it's heaven or hell, friend. We're going to close with a word of prayer. If you'd like to give your life to Christ, send me an email. Go to thepottershouseoceanside.com. Contact me. I'd love to get in touch with you, pray with you, share with you what God is doing in the earth. <clears throat> Tune into one of our services on the live stream. While we're still doing live stream, we're going to be back to live services, though. I don't know. Things will be changing. But God doesn't change. And his love for you never changes. Let's close the word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word together. Lord, we pr just pray your blessing on every hearing ear that would hear this Bible study. Bless them, Lord God. Let them know of your great love for them and save a multitude of lost sinners in this generation. Lord, show them, Lord God, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Lord, we pray this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you, Saint.